Here we are again with our old pal Willard van Orman Quine. Uh, another famous article, not as famous and influential as Two Dogmas of Empiricism, but um, definitely well known, and that's called Epistemology Naturalized. Okay, well, what does the title mean for the first thing? Well, epistemology, uh, since, well, epistemological issues have been with us since the dawn of philosophy. Uh, Plato talks about what we can know and uh, the knowing, what knowing does for the knower and things like that. In the era of modern philosophy, of course, we have Descartes, Descartes' meditations, and, and their epistemology is as what is sometimes called first philosophy. That is, before you can start philosoph philosophizing about anything like what the world is like, what things exist, what is right and what is wrong, you need to first know what it is to know anything. And then, once you establish that, you have some criterion to judge whether or not we can claim to know things about the external world, uh, things about ethics, things like that. So you've got to settle our standards of knowing first. And they give you guidelines that, um, uh, that affect the way that you reason in all other areas of philosophy. So epistemology in that sense is what you handle first, and, and that's evident in the way Descartes structures the meditations, where he, he talks about um, what we can know right up front. Um, Quine is a big fan of science, and in fact, Quine uh, doesn't make a clear distinction between between epistemology and the rest of philosophy, or between philosophy and science. He just talks in terms of our theory of the world. And our theory of the world includes all of science and philosophy, and there's no clear uh, boundaries between them. So, this very much uh, prevents us sort of taking a, a, a placing philosophy above science and saying, whoa, science, you can't make claims to know something because you're not meeting our strict philosophical standards, so therefore your scientific results fall short or something like that. Uh, that, that would be the sort of old-fashioned way of looking at um, epistemology as sort of above science and providing standards that science must reach, must meet. Uh, once you naturalize epistemology, you say epistemology is part of science and can use the scientific method. Now, uh, this would be um, quite radical because then you could, um, you, how is it that you're supposed to judge the standards that you use? How is it that you're supposed to, uh, that you can judge whether or not the products of science are things that we can actually know or that are in some sense theory laden or whatever? Well, as is usual with a Quine article, it's very dense and it's written in a way uh, that seems to require us having a huge amount of background information. It, Quine's articles uh, tend to read as if they're for an audience of buddies that he's already in the middle of uh, conversations with. Um, so it's, it's a hard to make sense of it, which is why, um, I, as the reading, I gave a version of Epistemology Naturalized that has sort of a commentary on it. Um, and chunks cut out. So let's talk about uh, some of his assumptions. The first and major assumption that he makes clear is something that he calls the quine duum thesis. This is, uh, he talks about in um, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. I don't think he calls it that, that there. Um, he starts calling it, maybe in Word and Object, which is his book that comes out in 1960, and it's, it's a little arrogant. Um, Pierre Duhem was a French physicist who made this claim about science, that 
uh, it, it's basically, you can call it confirmation holism, and I talked about it in, in talking about two dogmas of empiricism. That is, contrary to what the logical positivists say, the logical positivist says that every sentence, if it is meaningful and is not just true by the definition of the words involved, if it is meaningful, then it has clear um, criteria of um, testability. That is, it is relevant to specific um, facts about the world. So, and they are what make it meaningful. Um, and what Quine insists on, and he says Duhem insisted on before him, so if Duhem insisted on it before him, why is it called the Quine Duhem thesis? Why not just call it the Duhem thesis? But I guess maybe it had become famous as what Quine says, and Quine wanted to say, well, this other guy said it before me, and I've just discovered that, or... Anyway, the Quine Duhem thesis is this idea that um, while uh, the only evidence we have for our theory, our grand theory of the world, is observation of the natural world, um, it is relevant only, it only confirms or disconfirms our theory as a whole. And, and this is because no claim uh, that we make about the world can be directly tested in isolation from other claims. Like, for example, if I make a claim about uh, the motion of a planet and I observe through a telescope that my claim appears to be false, uh, that would appear to mean that the evidence disconfirms my specific claim about planetary motion. But of course it doesn't because I could say, no, 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 my claim about planetary motion is correct. The only reason the observation appears to disconfirm it is because there's something wrong with our theory of how this telescope works. Or there's some other facts we don't know, like there's another planet uh, that we haven't seen yet affecting the motion of the planet. So I, can, I don't have to disconfirm my particular claim. There's no evidence that will directly disconfirm that claim alone. It's always, and this is Quine's big contribution, it's actually up to us to pick which claim we want to disconfirm. It's not dictated by the evidence. It's our choice to decide, okay, I'm going to stick to my observational claim and I'm going to claim that this uh, telescope is faulty or something like that. We make the choices and nothing about our observation dictates that choice. So all we know is that our current observation doesn't fit with our whole theory. But which of the elements of our theory we decide to discard or maybe we decide to discard the observation itself. It's up to us. This is what confirmation holism is. And given that fact, it looks like one of the projects that uh, was particularly dear to one of the logical positivists uh, who had the longest career. Um, some logical positivists didn't make it out of Vienna. For example, Moritz Schlick was shot by a, a crazy ex-student on the steps of, uh, I think, the university, um, but one who, who had a long and distinguished career in, in America was Rudolf Carnap, and he sort of evolved out of um, logical positivism and started calling it logical empiricism instead, and uh, uh, sort of gave up some aspects of logical positivism, but took the core insights and sort of said, no, 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 we can work with this. And Carnap and Quine had a long going back and forth um, over the decades in America. And, and, and uh, Carnap was older than Quine and, and a great influence on Quine. Uh, so he res uh, Quine respected Carnap, but said he was wrong about some things. Anyway, Carnap, uh, his big project was that he wanted to see if you could justify your theory by logically reducing it to, statement, to these observation statements. Now, observation statements, which Quine remains committed to, are the kind of thing that uh, people like Kuhn or more um, extreme, or a more extreme version is a guy called Paul Feyerabend, 
would say observation sentences are kind of a, a, a myth. You cannot have these sentences. So Quine maintains that although in general uh, it's the theory as, as a whole that is confirmed or disconfirmed by the evidence, he's, he still maintains that there are very specific sentences that can be confirmed or disconfirmed. But these are very rare and right at the edge. And he says, the reason why he says there has to be some of these is because he says otherwise we would never be able to learn language. Uh, here's where he and Wittgenstein would butt heads um, because Wittgenstein has that analysis of extensive defini uh, definition where you point to something and say that's a table or something like that and says that you, in order to do that you have to already be immersed in the language game of extensive definition. Quine thinks you can do extensive definition and in fact you have to be able to do that otherwise babies would never acquire language. There has to be an, uh, an entering wedge into language and it has to be uh, these very basic claims about the world that uh, uh, can be confirmed or disconfirmed by the evidence. So um, Quine and Carnap share this belief in observation sentences and what um, uh, the project that, that Carnap is interested in is to try to justify our theory of the world by showing that it, uh, it reduces to our evidence for it. Now Quine says this is an epistemological pro uh, uh, project because what we're trying to do is we're trying to show how our view of how the world works, which is sort of our, uh, you know, might say, like our collective beliefs about the world, is justified on the basis of the evidence we have for it. And that's very much like the old epistemological um, project of saying, can I know that there's an external world? My evidence for it is what my senses are telling me, but is that evidence enough to justify the belief I have that there's a world out there and the skeptics say no. Um, so this is just sort of on a larger scale. So instead of talking about individual people's beliefs, we're talking about the hum humankind's um, collective theory of the world. Is that justified based on the basis of the kind of input or uh, that we as humans have? And uh, Carnap wants to try and do that. Now, because of the Quine duem thesis, uh, essentially, Quine says you can't do that. You cannot reduce um, theoretical sentences individually to observational sentences. And consequently, uh, you can have, and this is the um, indeterminacy of translation, another one of Quine's key and controversial theses you can have uh, inconsistent theories of the world that are equally confirmed by the evidence and there is no way to decide between them. Um, so we have to give up on this. So, but epistemology, if there is such a thing as epistemology, its job is to explain the relationship between our theory of the world and the observational evidence. Well, the logical positivist thought it could be done this way. It can't. Uh, this kind of project is like, uh, in the beginning of his article, he compares it with what Frege and Russell were trying to do with math. They were trying to say, well, we have this, we have math, uh, how can we justify our mathematical beliefs? Well, if we could reduce them to the claims of logic, which is more basic and elementary and, and self-evidently true, then that would in some sense justify math. Well, we couldn't. Uh, that's one of the things that, for example, Gödel's incompleteness shows that this, this project won't work. And Quine is saying a similar thing, we can't do uh, the reduction of theory into observational sentences. Where does that leave epistemology? Well, Quine says the only other option is to treat epistemology, is to naturalize epistemology. That is, to treat epistemology as instead a study of what humans do in fact do. Because humans, as a matter of fact, are constantly producing 
theories of the world on the basis of our sensory stimulus. Uh, uh, Quine calls a late work of his From Stimulus to Science, which is, he, he talks about us as sort of like bags of nerve endings, and he says uh, our nerve endings are stimulated. That's the input. That from this, uh, as he calls it, meager input, just uh, electrical signals that we're getting from our nerve endings, we construct, as he puts it, this torrential, this uh, far more ornate and convoluted description of, the w of reality, our theoretical view of, uh, of the explanation of our sensory stimulation. Uh, and, and epistemology's job now, according to Quine, given that it can't be reduced to uh, in this way, is to just say, well, how do humans do that? How do humans produce this huge theoretical output on the basis of sensory input? So on a more, uh, a, a very basic example would be, how is it that we see in 3D given that our input is 2D, that we're just getting stimulation that it doesn't really have a dimension, it's just uh, electrical impulses reaching our brain, uh, and as far as we know they're not uh, caused by 3D objects, and yet we see the world in 3D. Why is it that we see the th world in 3D? How are we constructing 3D pictures of the world from 2D input? That's an epistemological issue. How do we do it? Uh, and so, for example, uh, a naturalized epistemologist would be interested in something called Mars theory of vision, which is a scientific study of how this works. And that's, what, that's the kind of thing that epistemologists should be interested in. They shouldn't be interested in this crusty old philosophical business of, uh, you know, the kind of thing that Gettier wrote on, you know, what are the conditions for knowing that P? No, you should get into the science, because science is all we have to go on. Um, so if knowledge, knowledge is a, a natural phenomenon that can be studied, our knowledge is our picture of the world. So here, of course, classical epistemologists would say, well, we, we can't call it knowledge yet, because we don't know if it meets the standards of knowledge. But to say that is to say that there's something above science that can judge what the correct standards are. And there aren't. There isn't. There's only science. All we have to go on is science. Quine is, is very fond of quoting another logical positivist called Otto Neurath, uh, who has an image of a ship. And he says, we're on this ship and we're building the ship at the same time we're on it. We're building the ship that we're floating on. Um, and that's our relationship to science. That is, we're using science at the same time we're thinking about science. But you, there is no, you can't get off the ship of science to look down on it and say, oh, we're doing it right. The only standards by which to judge science are science. There, or, where science here is taken broadly to include all of our theory of the world, which includes philosophy. But the method of science, uh, like natural science, is the most successful and therefore preferable methodology because, as the positivist pointed out, science was far more, was advancing at a massively accelerated rate in the early 20th century with Einstein and quantum mechanics and all of that stuff. Um, so clearly science's methodology is, is the one that we should be using. Okay, so knowledge is a natural uh, phenomenon. It resolves the issue of epistemological priority. What's this? Well, he says uh, prior, uh, a, a fairly recent dispute in, in epistemology that he says now is, goes by the board is, um, was brought up by the Gestalt psychologists. And Gestalt psychologists say we don't actually um, perceive in the way that classic philosophers like uh, Descartes and Locke, and in particular Locke, Berkeley and Hume say. They say we get, we are directly aware of 
sense data first, like patches of red and patches of blue, and then uh, Locke in particular paints this picture. We take these tiny little Lego building blocks and then we construct them together to form objects. So an object is constructed in our mind from all of these tiny little individual, very basic sense data. Um, and the Gestalt psychologist says that's not true. We just directly see the world in 3D. We don't see the world in 2D and then infer a 3D world. We directly uh, perceive in 3D. That's what we're all we're ever conscious of. We're never conscious of the sensory stimulations that uh, are uh, uh, sort of cause, you might say, our, our 3D picture of the world. We're never conscious of those. What we're conscious of immediately is a 3D picture of the world. We see the world in color in 3D and that's what we're conscious of. So that's our first, that should have epistemological priority over the unconscious stuff that causes it. Um, and Quine says, well, once we see knowledge as a natural phenomenon, we, uh, epistemological priority is resolved by what should come first, the conscious or the unconscious. And he says it's obviously the unconscious because uh, if you're viewing things in a naturalistic way, you look to the, the causal origin, and the causal origin of our 3D picture of the world is the sensory stimulation, so that comes first. And he suggests at the end of the article, possible projects for, epist uh, for naturalized epistemology is to look at, our, do humans have a certain limited number of epistemological building blocks? It, it, and he draws the analogy with phonemes in, in linguistics. In linguistics, there's this idea of phonemes that there's a, a finite number of uh, audible um, sounds that can be the basis of words and language, if languages share the same set then humans, we know something about languages of which humans are capable of speaking. You can't uh, use, you can't have more uh, phonetic distinctions than we're capable of perceiving and maybe there are, you know, we, there's sort of, uh, humans have a limited resolution you might say, a, a limited pixel um, density in our uh, perception of the world. That would be something worth finding out and that would tell us, that would tell us something about what we can know. Or another suggestion is evolutionary epistemology. Why do we see the world in color? For example, I, I imagine uh, this is an example, uh, you know we have color in the center of our eye retinas and black and white uh, rods uh, color cones, color sensing cones and black and white sensing rods on the periphery of our vision. What this, the, now the black and white ones are much more sensitive to minute changes in light, which is why in your peripheral vision you can detect motion much better. And the evolutionary uh, suggestion for this is this is good if you're being hunted by, if you're a, a prey animal as we are, uh, this will enable you to detect the movement of tigers or wolves uh, off to the side and you, can, you will immediately see them. You will be much harder to sneak up on. But of course, these features of our eyes, while they serve an evolutionary purpose, uh, dictate how we view the world. So evolutionary epistemology would say the way we view the world is a product of uh, forces that enabled us to survive. Um, now, epistemology in general, or certainly before this suggestion, was deemed to be normative. That is, epistemology, this is why it was first philosophy. This is why Descartes starts with epistemology, because he says we've got to give, uh, produce standards to judge our knowledge claims in other spheres when we start making metaphysical or ethical claims. Uh, we judge them by the standards that epistemology has given us. So epistemology provides us with norms, standards to judge knowledge in other spheres. Can naturalized epistemology do that? Or is it just a descriptive enterprise? Uh, does it just say this is how uh, we acquire our picture of the world? Is it the right picture of the world? I'm not interested in that, it seems like. It seems like, uh, and science is, norm, is often said, there's usually said to be a fact-value distinction. Science is interested in the facts, 
you know, like scientists would say, it's just the fact that humans are violent. We don't say that it's a good thing, we just tell you why humans are violent, because, you know, it helps in survival or it was evolutionary practical or something. We're not saying it's a good thing or that it should continue, we're just telling you the facts. We're not judging the facts. So, if epistemology is now just part of science, can it provide us with standards? Uh, Quine says yes, it can give us standards, the standards of science, uh, the standards of scientific rigor. So if we want to know, are we in a position to know this? Well, so, uh, you know, science would say, do you, you will be in a position to know it if you're in the kind of circumstances where the typical human can provide a picture that is reliable. Um, now, but then is there any way to get outside of science and say, is science doing it right? No. Uh, there is no such thing for, uh, for Quine as first philosophy. Again, back to Neurath's ship. We can't get off the ship and look down on it and judge it. So although Quine says it does provide us with norms, the, they're the norms of science and we can't judge those. Um, so other, although Quine says yes, other people, the critics, would say no. Uh, naturalized epistemology has become uh, an important part of um, uh, epistemology, but it hasn't killed off the old-fashioned epistemology either. Now it's just so epistemology is just a larger animal. Quine would have had it kill off all the other kinds of epistemology. He's, he would say, well, come on, haven't you seen? I've told you that uh, uh, the old-fashioned epistemology it's obvious that it's a pointless exercise, but epistemology goes on regardless. Uh, it's just now there's a new subsection of epistemology thanks to Quine and people who are influenced by him.
Gettier cases are pretty much, uh, they multiply. They're, these aren't rare ones. These aren't specifically uh, very, um, very contrived cases. It's, it's fairly easy to come up with cases like this. In fact, there's some suggestion that Bertrand Russell uh, came up with his own cases uh, a long time previously in a book of his. So that's a little bit of controversy. It's, it's not necessarily clear that Gettier was the first person to publish on this. But certainly, he did a good, good job of presenting the cases. And they have led to uh, a sort of sea change in um, epistemology, uh, in this kind of epistemology. You can, so the, the Gettier problem is what's missing? What is the extra element that we need to add um, so that if you meet one, two, three, four, then you do know something? That's the debate. Or there is some suggestion that this is okay and that we can fix this and respond to Gettier cases. But certainly, Gettier presented a challenge that epistemologists then had to meet, which is why this article short as it is, is so famous.